Good morning, friends, and welcome to the last Sunday of September. We're talking about September 26, 2021, and the last sermon in our series in the book of Acts. It's been a long but very beautiful and inspiring series as we've gone through the history of the early church, and we're going to finish it up today with this message entitled, The Gift Goes On. As a part of finishing our series in the book of Acts, we'll be observing the Lord's Supper today. So if you've got a chance right now, pause your video. Go find a little cup of juice and a cracker so that you can celebrate with us anything you feel is appropriate just to recognize the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll be doing that near the end of our message. So, friends, come celebrate the Lord's Supper with us as we celebrate how God used the early church and people like the Apostle Paul to set up the continuing history of the church. That's why we call this message, The Gift Goes On. Because the early church was the beginning of the writing of his story. That's why we call it his story. Uh, his story throughout history that is not complete yet. And you and I are a part of that continuing saga. Well, as we get to Acts chapter 28, verses 30 and 31, this is how the book ends. It says that Paul stayed two whole years in his own rented house. And he welcomed all who visited him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. This is the way the book ends. Now, some would say, boy, you can tell Luke must be a doctor. He sure isn't a writer, because look how he just drops it at the end. In fact, John Polhill writes that this ending of Luke is totally unacceptable. I mean, did he think he would you know, add another volume? Did something happen that just made him stop? And uh, didn't he intend to write another chapter? seems like he drops it, but I think that's by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to let us know that the next chapters of the book of Acts are all about the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say, about what you and I have done with the message and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to carry the gospel to the world. So with that thought in mind, you know, a lot of, a lot of theologians have speculated, shall we say, about why the ending drops like this. But I think it's no accident. I think it's something God intended just to help us focus on the fact that the story goes on from here. Now, while Paul was in Rome, there were a lot of great things going on. We do know historically, Paul at Rome becomes a centerpiece for the brand new explosion of Christianity all to the west of Rome and the north of Rome that continued long after Paul's martyrdom. In fact, Paul's presence here is where much of the New Testament was actually written. Keep in mind that when Paul is given these two years to operate out of his own house, to reach people for the gospel, to share Christ with others, he not only did that and reached a lot of the local people, but Remember, he writes other epistles while he is there. He writes Philippians, Ephesians, and Colossians. He also writes the letter to Philemon, all in your New Testament, sometime in those two years when he's there in Rome. But then after that, he was supposedly released, as some would say. Uh, some even say he traveled to Spain after that. And then he wrote other books in your New Testament, Titus and First and Second Timothy. Second Timothy being apparently his last letter to write that we have in our New Testament. And of course, after that, he did end up returning to Rome. Don't know all the circumstances of that. A lot of speculation, a lot of people who have written ideas about how he ended up back in Rome. But he was imprisoned by the Roman Emperor Nero, increasingly fanatical, ends up burning Rome and blaming it on the Christians. He was just a nut. And therefore, many, many people, not just Paul, suffered under his terrible reign. Paul was probably martyred somewhere in the years 64, 65 AD. So very much of church history goes back to this particular time when Paul not only wrote so many books from Rome, but also had such a personal impact on the church there that it echoes literally down to our day. But you know, the abrupt ending of this particular book is, again, not to be taken lightly. I think Luke gives us such a tremendous uh, history of the early church that you can tell is just put piece 
by piece together by the Holy Spirit working through Luke. And it's, it's a magnificent work for it to just end the way it does, again, has baffled people down through the ages. But when he completes his work, and, you know, some say different times. I want to quote Dr. W.A. Criswell. He says that Luke probably finished his work around 63 A.D. And because of that, he doesn't mention that Paul comes back, is rearrested, and is martyred. So he says Luke had to have written it before that time. There are others who say, oh, he didn't write it until 70 A.D. or later. Uh, well, it's most likely that he did write it earlier just because of this ending. And not only did he write it and leave this wide open, but at this particular time, because so many of these other issues weren't completed, it, it's probably true that this lengthy book was being copied and recopied over and over again so it could be passed out to people in the church all over the world. So that process began probably around 63 AD. And then Inspired by the Holy Spirit, we say that Luke leaves this open ending pointing to the continuance of the history of the church, a story that is still being written today. Who's it being written by? Folks just like you and I who are participating in the worldwide movement that Jesus said would culminate in his second coming because he said in this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world and then and only then will the end come. Now, for that reason, we're going to use Paul's account today of the Lord's Supper to celebrate that time with us, because there's nothing like what many call communion to help us realize the unity of the body of Christ all around the world. So right now, I have these wonderful little cups that uh, when COVID hit, it's like we have to use these things now. We can't pass out the elements the way we used to. Some of you are in churches, and we've done this before, where you literally take a loaf of bread, uh, of unleavened bread, and you're breaking pieces off of it. But no, 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 we're trying to be healthy, and we're not handling things the way we used to. But it's not the style of the elements that you use. It's the observance itself. And when it comes to that observance, Paul points out some things in his first letter to the Corinthians that I think are important as you and I observe the Lord's Supper today. And I'm going past the actual passage of the Lord's Supper itself as Paul gives reasons why we do it and what we should be doing in our hearts as we observe the Lord's Supper. Look what he says. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and blood of the Lord. So let a person examine himself. Here's one of the purposes of the Lord's Supper, self-examination. It's a time where you say, I'm about to recognize what Jesus did for me on the cross. I'm about to take something that symbolizes his precious body, his precious blood. So isn't this a great time to say, Holy Spirit, examine me? Seek out everything in my heart that might be unpleasing to you so that I can come with a clear conscience before the Lord. So he says, let a person examine himself, and in this way, let him eat the bread and drink from the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many are sick and ill among you, and many have fallen asleep. He didn't mean that they got bored and passed out because they needed a nap. Falling asleep is a reference to death. He's saying literally because you as believers now, he's talking not to unbelievers, but believers. You as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ refuse to examine yourself. Let the Holy Spirit examine you so that your heart stays right before God. Many of you have sinned yourself into God's discipline. Others have died just because they're not paying attention to their own spiritual lives. So look what he says in verse 31. If we were properly judging ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we're judged by the Lord, we're disciplined so that we may not be condemned with the world. So as we come before the Lord's Supper today, I want you to take time. I'm going to pray here in just a second over our elements today. And as we pray, I want you to let the Holy Spirit examine your heart. Allow him to find any wicked way in you. Anything that needs to be corrected. Is there someone you need to apologize to? Is there a wrong that needs to be righted? Is there something that's going on in your life that you know is not pleasing to God, but you haven't been willing to dispose of it? 
get that trash can out today and write it on a piece of paper and crumple it up and confess that sin to the Lord and say, I'm throwing this away, Lord. I want you to cleanse my heart and take it out of my system. And let's do what I believe the Lord's Supper's main purpose was. Let's do what God, I believe, himself wanted us to do every time we sit before the elements that represent the body and blood of Jesus. Let's look at ourselves from the inside out. Let the Holy Spirit look at us. Quit pointing at your neighbor, your friend, the other person that we often accuse. Instead, let the finger come back into your own heart and say, God, what would you have me to do? Now let's pray and thank him for the greatest sacrifice of all. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity of, to observe the Lord's Supper today, to recognize that your body hung on a cross for us the body of a perfect, sinless, spotless Lamb of God. Thank you for giving, not just to teach us and to lead us, but to literally sacrifice for us. Father, thank you for the juice. It just represents your precious blood that shed, was shed for us at Calvary. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the blood the precious blood that cleanses of sin and puts us in a right relationship with God and brings us into the family of God. Lord, we thank you for it. Thank you for the sacrifice as we look back. Now, Father, as we look inward, help us to allow your Holy Spirit to point out the things we need to change, to correct, to repent of, so that we with a clear conscience can receive your Lord's Supper today. And then as we look forward, to your second coming, as we recognize this little symbol of what you did in the past, Lord, we look forward to the great establishment of your kingdom in the future. Thank you, Lord, for this time that we can share together all over the world, receiving this which represents your body and your blood. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, friends, as we look at the passage that Paul wrote, again, to the Corinthians, where he talks about the Lord's Supper, we're going to observe it together. The first thing he says in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three 23 is, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, that on the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. And it says, When he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, whatever you've used, whatever kind of a wafer, cracker, whatever it might be, no, that's not the literal body of Jesus. It didn't change when you prayed over it. It's a symbol. It's a reminder. A reminder of what Jesus did for us. A reminder of how he came and took on a fleshly human body. And he lived for us the life we could never live for ourselves. A life of holy perfection. And then gave that life to us for our salvation. Isn't it beautiful? That's what today is all about. And then he goes on and writes in verses 25 and 26. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Now do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. That's why I drink this little cup right now. A reminder of the precious blood of Jesus. Amen and amen. And in verse 26, he says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. There it is, looking backward at what Jesus did for us on the cross, looking inward to let the Holy Spirit examine ourselves and make sure we leave from the Lord's table with a clear conscience, and looking forward to the great event that will culminate all history on earth, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, thanks for joining us today. That's what today's all about, celebrating that the book of Acts is not over, my friends. It goes on and on. How long does it go on? It goes on until Jesus comes. That's why we observe the Lord's Supper regularly, so that we can keep pointing people to Jesus until he comes. God bless you. You have a great day in him. We'll see you next week, every day as we wake up in the word and next Sunday right here from First Baptist Church in Winsboro, South Carolina.
We have a very special day next Sunday. I'm going to be doing something a little bit unusual. Haven't figured out how we're going to do this yet because we have a guest preacher. We are looking forward to having Brother Randy Shepherd from Crossfire Ministries in Asheville to preach in the pulpit next Sunday. And other folks are going to be here helping us with a little mini basketball camp for the kids in the afternoon. We're going to be doing all of this to help share Jesus with everyone that needs him. So we're going to be having a great time in the Lord next week. And uh, we'll see what we can post about that so we can let you know what's going on. Well, God bless you. You have a great day in the Lord. And we'll see each and every day this week as we wake up in the word, look at his biblical perspective and have worship in First Baptist Church in Winsboro, South Carolina. God bless you.